turn to God's word today and respond, not only during the message today, but throughout the day, and heading into this week. How does Jesus see me? Ask yourself that question. How does Jesus see me? And then related to that, am I, and does Jesus see that I am believing him? And thus, because I really actually do believe him, I really do believe the gospel, I'm lavishly, I mean not meagerly, but lavishly, worshiping and loving Jesus. Because if I believe the gospel, if I actually believe Jesus is the Son of God, I'm going to lavishly worship and love him. So another way of putting this, and you'll see this image from the scripture today, do my tears. Tears of sorrow at my sin, but then gratitude and joy at his forgiveness rain down on Jesus. When you pray to Jesus, is it deeply in your heart? Do you cry? Do you love Jesus? Do you reach out to him? How does Jesus see me? So today, we're going to pick back up in Luke's gospel. We've been preaching through Luke, and we're going to begin with our closing verse from last Sunday. Luke chapter 7, verse 28, but read all the way through the close of what's now marked off as Luke chapter 7. So Luke 7, verse 28 through verse 50. Hear now God's word. Jesus is closing out this statement about John the Baptist after the Baptist disciples who came to question Jesus have left. And he says, I tell you, Jesus says, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and even the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the law experts rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him, that is by John the Baptist. Jesus continues his teaching. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children, little children, sitting in the marketplace, calling out to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating uh, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. One of the Pharisees asked him, that is Jesus, to eat with him. And having entered into the Pharisee's house, he reclined, that is, at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she knew that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she took an alabaster flask of perfumed oil, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the perfumed oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he graciously forgave both. Now, which of them will love him more? Answering, Simon said, I suppose that it is the one who he, he forgave the most. 
And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For as evidence of it, she has loved much. But he, to whom little is forgiven, loves little. And he, Jesus, said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So who loves God? A Pharisee or a publicly shamed sinner? This woman may even be a prostitute. Sounds like one of those stories, right? A Pharisee and a prostitute in the same place. So who loves God? The good person, religious man, or the woman of the city? Who? Who loves God? And behold, that means we're really supposed to look when Luke says, behold, woo, that's just shocking. Behold, there she is, a woman of the city who was a sinner. When she learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask full of perfumed oil and standing behind him at his feet weeping. Now, let me pull out of this and let, let's picture what we're talking about here. And let me give you the background on this. So this is a typical Hellenistic banquet. We're talking about this Pharisee is throwing a banquet. And it's probably some kind of Jewish version of what would be called a symposia. This is you not only eat, you spend all kinds of time discussing things, ideas. This is what the high-level educated folks do, the elite do. You have symposia to discuss things. And the way it's physically arranged, a couple things I want to make clear to you are, the way it works is everybody leans in towards each other. This is the way the Last Supper apparently was happening in large part, too. You're on your left elbow, okay, leaning in. You're eating and serving and passing food with your right hand. Your feet are outward, so the only thing out to the public are your feet. Uh, now, this kind of event, with a, this Pharisee is apparently really well off, really high thought of, he's highly educated and he's rich, like honestly some of the people I'm looking at right now. Okay, so he's throwing this banquet and everybody in the town is able to kind of work their way in, kind of edge their way in the doorways, and they're probably packed around the banquet because Jesus is a major celebrity. Jesus for months has been healing, even raising the dead, casting out demons. Some people say he's the Messiah. Without doubt, he's some kind of prophet, at least at the level of John the Baptist. He seems to be a different kind of prophet. But this is a major league religious celebrity. Nobody like this has hit Galilee in anybody's history. Okay? So he is at this banquet, and people, the, the crowds are probably packed. There are probably more people at this banquet that were at the fourth quarter of the Mississippi State football game yesterday after all the students left. So anyway, there's a lot of people packed around this banquet table. And this sinful woman, different thoughts on this. She may or may not be a prostitute. Different commentators go different ways on this. But she is described as, as Luke puts it, a woman of the city. This woman of the city who is a known public sinner works her way in the crowd. So you got it? I mean, the, the, the important people are facing in. The, the, the masses are out all around. This is a spectacle. If you're a big shot, you can kind of impress the whole town with putting, off, uh, putting on this banquet. And 
And so she works her way through the crowd and, and she makes her way to behind Jesus, directly behind Jesus and behind his feet. So that's where we are. And the question before the symposium seems to be, is Jesus really a validated prophet or not? Maybe we need to hear a little bit more from him. Maybe I need to think about how I could adjust my religion a little bit to hear from this teacher. You know, that's kind of seems to be the discussion. And here is this woman standing behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, openly weeping, crying. Tears are coming out of her eyes and raining down. The language, the verb there means like they're raining down. I mean, profuse crying all over, you know, coming down on Jesus's feet with her tears and she wipes them with the hair of her head. Now, a married woman in this culture is supposed to have the way they, the way Paul would put it is her head covered. That means her hair is wrapped. Uh, a single woman may have her hair out, you know, long, but that's viewed as being potentially provocative. Uh, only a husband is supposed to see his wife wife's hair out, you know, that's, that's saved for the bedroom. But single women could in this culture, it's somewhat uh, flexible on this, maybe, maybe, maybe not, it's scandalous that she has her hair out, but she is wetting Jesus' feet, so she starts, because there's no towel made available for Jesus, she is wiping his feet with her own hair. And it goes beyond that. She's profusely kissing, bowing down before Jesus, kissing his feet. And then she takes this alabaster flask of perfumed anointing oil, which a woman, and by the way, if, if she is a woman of the street, this is the, you know, central to her trade because she needs to be attractive and perfumed. And even if this is just an inheritance of hers, this is very valuable. And from the language that we read, it is apparent that she doesn't just take a drop for Jesus, she breaks the thing open and she gives Jesus everything she has. Whether she is renouncing her previous life of sin specifically with this, or whether she's just saying, I, I don't want to give you a tithe, Jesus, <laughs> you need the whole thing. She is giving him the whole thing and anointing his feet as she kisses them. And you know Jesus is the anointed one. He's the Messiah. So you've got some major league depth recognition here going on potentially. What is Jesus' verdict for her? for this kind of woman. Some people would call, call her crazy, fanatical, like about Jesus. His verdict for her is this, forgiveness and salvation by faith. Forgiveness and salvation by faith given to her. He says, Jesus says to her, your sins have been forgiven and your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He's giving her peace and welcoming her into the kingdom. This is a blessing of the kingdom that he's giving her. Now let's go back to where we read through and what's going on here. Remember Luke chapter 7 verse 28. Jesus says, we look at this last week, among those born of women, none, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Now we looked at this last week. I'm gonna come at it from a different angle for you today. And you can fill in the blanks if you're following along with the sermon note, because this is the, I mean, one of the only, or maybe about the only blank I've got for you today, but I do want you to get this. The one who is least in the kingdom is not just born of a woman, but born of, can you fill in the blank? Can you fill in the blank? Anybody know John's Gospel, chapter 3? You must be born from above. You must be born of God. So this is born of God, born of the Holy Spirit. So you see the contrast Jesus is making here. Of those born of the flesh, born of women, nobody's greater than John. But the least who is born of the Holy Spirit born anew for the kingdom of God through salvation in Jesus is greater than John. That's what Jesus just said there. That's another 
aspect of what Jesus is saying in verse 28. And remember, let me just take you back to John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 5. Remember another Pharisee who's more interested, apparently, than Simon the Pharisee is, but comes to Jesus in the night, you know, secretly, because most of the Pharisees are against Jesus. This Pharisee named Nicodemus comes to Jesus and, and asks him, and Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you must be born again. And then, verse 5, Jesus says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, that means God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And again, over to the first letter of John the Apostle, chapter 3, verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Now, do Christians sin? Yes, Jesus teaches us to pray for forgiveness for sins. But do Christians, people who are actually born again, continue in a same and similar pattern of sin without repenting and turning for healing and new direction? No, it's not going to happen if you're actually born again, if you're really a Christian. 1 John 3, 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So next we move on to, as we approach our main passage today, this is important for understanding this. Put a pin in this passage. I'll come back to it. But I do want to give you a little bit of it now. This is what, I, what we would refer to as the parable of the brats. The parable of the brats. And according to Jesus, most people are actually brats in God's eyes, the way they're living in their sin, okay? They want it their way. I want it their way. There are people that come to church that want it their way. This is the way I like it. You mean the, the brats, right? The little kids. So Jesus uses a term, and he says, to what shall I compare the men of, or the anthropoid, the people, humanity, of this generation? This is the first time we get this generation used by Jesus in the Gospel of, of Luke, and every time he uses it, you don't want to be included with this generation. It's a bad term. You today, in 2023, don't want to be included with this generation. Okay? And so Jesus compares this generation to brats. He says they're like little kids. Idea, okay? They're like little kids. And here's what they say. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. In other words, that's to John the Baptist. You were too severe. You preached too much hellfire and damnation. That's not the kind of religion we wanted. That's not what we wanted. We wanted to feel good about ourselves. And then Jesus says, then you turn around, and you sing a dirge for me, and say, I need to be more severe instead of being the gospel of grace, sharing good news with tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners, and bringing them back home to God. So in other words, you want to push John around your way, and then you turn around and claim something totally different and reject me. The point is, you're rejecting anybody God's sending to you. You want it your way. You don't care what the preacher says or who the preacher is. <laughs> you don't care what the Bible says because you don't have time for it. You want it your way at church, in your life, in your house, in your world, with your body, whatever. And then Jesus says this, yet wisdom, that means God's wisdom, is justified by all her children. And that includes definitely, oh yes, John the Baptist and Jesus, but it includes everybody who actually believes. And conversely, everybody is condemned who rejects as a brat what Jesus is calling them to do. Joel Green, in his commentary, sets up this inverted parallelism here that I think is pretty good. It shows us what's happening with the flow here. In verse 29, all the people justified God. You see that? And then with the middle two verses, or the middle two segments here, Pharisees reject God's purposes, and this generation rejects both John and Jesus. That's 30 through 34, with the two combos there. And then finally, verse 35, you see the justification thing. Luke is framing this for us with Jesus' words. Wisdom is justified by her children. Now, that's the parable of the brats and the teaching on that. Let's move on. Understand that sets up our understanding of what is happening with the woman and the Pharisee and Jesus. So we're at the banquet of grace. That's what I'm calling it, the banquet of grace. The banquet of grace is set before you today. How are you going to play it? How are you going to respond? We have three main characters here in the banquet of grace. Simon, the Pharisee. Jesus, and the banquet 
crashing sinful woman. Simon, Jesus, and the banquet crashing sinful woman. Jesus is reclining. That means at table. He's, he's leaning in. But behold, whoo, wow, a woman of the city, a sinner. She's not only in the room. And by the way, if you touch her, if you get near to her under uh, cleanliness laws, you are defiled. You better not touch her, and God forbid she touch you. She is a publicly known sinner. But we've already seen through multiple chapters now, right? Jesus sanctifies sinners. Jesus is not worried about being defiled by sinners. He touches them and sanctifies them. But anyway, she's in the room. I mean, publicly known sinner. And there she is with this alabaster flask with perfumed anointing oil. She's standing behind Jesus at his feet. Her tears are raining down. That's the verb <laughs> that's indicated here. They're raining down. She's wiping his feet with her unbound, did you hear it? Uncovered head, unbound hair, kissing his feet and anointing them with the incredibly expensive perfumed anointing oil. The whole thing. I mean, the whole, the whole container. And so Simon, who apparently is more modern and open-minded because he's an elite, he's, he's more open-minded than the so-called far right of the Pharisees. You know, he's still interested in, let's, let's talk. You may have something to teach me. I can kind of question you and tweak you, Jesus. Let's, let's get together and talk. But the open question is, is Jesus a prophet? And so Simon, to himself, is sitting there thinking, well, obviously he's not a prophet. I mean, anybody in the room knows who this woman is. And he not only apparently is oblivious to who she is and what she's like, he's letting her touch him. Defile him. I mean, kissing his feet and doing all this, this is horrendous. He's obviously not a prophet. Now, of course, Jesus is not only a prophet, he is much more than a prophet. And so Jesus, of course, knows what Simon is. Do you know Jesus knows what you're thinking? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Jesus says, hey, Simon, this is the first time we get Simon's name, actually, and Jesus calls him out with his name. Simon, um, I have something to say to you. Now, let me just warn you. If you ever get into a situation where Jesus says, I have something to say to you, you may want to get down on your knees with your face to the ground and say, please, Lord. Because uh, if Jesus is going to address Simon here, we know this is going to be overwhelming. So here it comes. The parable of the two forgiven debtors. And the question and answer with Simon about grace and love. So Jesus tells this little parable about a creditor with two debtors. They're both debtors. Okay, one owes um, a couple years worth of wages. One owes a couple months worth of wages. 500 denarii, 50 denarii. But Jesus makes it clear neither one can repay. They're both stuck, and they both should be thrown in debtor's prison and become slaves. Okay, they deserve slavery. That's what Jesus is saying. Neither one can pay back. They're both total debtors. One owes a huge amount, one owes a lot, but he doesn't have the capability to repay it. There's no way, either one. So Jesus says the creditor graciously forgives both debtors, the one who owes the huge amount and the one who owes a modicum amount, but he can't repay it. And then Jesus says, so tell me, Simon, which one is going to love the forgiveness creditor more? And Simon Stuck says, well, I suppose it is the one who's been forgiven a lot more. And Jesus says, you have judged correctly. Do you hear that? You have judged correctly. Now, here we come. Seeing 
the woman and Simon the way Jesus sees them. He sees both of them as debtors who cannot repay what they owe. The fancy guy with all the education, able to throw the big banquet, probably the biggest shot in town, and the well-known public woman of the city. They're both debtors who cannot even begin to repay what they owe. And you know what? You and I are in that group too. Debtors who cannot begin to repay what we owe. So Jesus, you have to get this, sees Simon as a debtor too, who has no capability to repay what he owes. Everyone, everyone in the room, in that banquet room, you and I, everyone in this sanctuary today, everyone watching online, we're all. And then Jesus says, Simon, do you see this woman? In other words, I know you noticed her. I know you think she's horrible, but have you actually looked at her? I want you to look at this woman right now. No, 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 don't turn away. Don't tell me you're too holy to look at her. I want you to look at her right now. Okay, let's go through this, Simon. See, others, including definitely the Pharisee, saw a shameful sinner to be shunned, but Jesus sees a sinner needing the Father's grace. A lost sheep needing the shepherd's saving love. You know, that's the way Jesus sees everybody. Isn't that awesome? That's the way he sees you. Simon, do you see her and do you see yourself? Now let's go through this, Simon. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she, she has not ceased, you know, crying, raining down tears to wet my feet. You gave me no kiss of friendship which is what any good Middle Easterner is supposed to do. You're supposed to kiss on the cheek, right, and welcome. It's a sign of friendship love. Even if I don't know you that well, if I invite you to a meal at my house, that means we're basically extended family together. You are supposed to. You have to do this. Simon has not done this because he's brought Jesus in like kind of a backbencher at a worship service. Just let me kind of see. I'll kind of think about it, you know. So you gave me no kiss of friendship love, but she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she, she's anointed my feet with incredibly expensive perfumed oil. What is a host supposed to do, Simon? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might? You wanted to discuss that tonight. What is the crux of being a good Jew? What is the crux of fulfilling the Shema? Okay, let's talk about that, Simon. When I invite you into my house, what do I do? Tell me. You prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. You do what? You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over, and I shall dwell in your house. David prays and hopes, and we pray and hope forever. That's the way God hosts. So Simon, how have you done for me? And by the way, how have we done for Jesus? Hmm? Therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, her sins, which are many, I mean, they are many, have been forgiven. For as evidence of it, she has loved much. But he to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Forgiven, as evidence of it, she has loved much. That's my, I put that in there. Some, most translations don't have that, but the, the Hati clause here is confusing. The Hati clause, that's the four clause, the because clause. Uh, sorry, a little bit of Bible nerd, but you've got to know this for the gospel now. It is in this Greek, causative, not. No, not causative, but evidential. Uh, go to Mool's classic idiom book of the New Testament Greek and also various other commentators, but definitely all the way back to John Calvin, for instance. Um, la cause de la remission, no, 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 no. It is 
Not here said, Calvin says, that men's love toward God, this is my basic uh, kind of crude uh, translation here, that men's love toward God is the cause of the forgiveness of sins. And he goes on and says this, loving is not here said to be the cause of pardon, but a subsequent manifestation of receiving the Lord's prior pardon. In other words, the woman has already apparently encountered Jesus and his gospel and knows that she is forgiven and she is coming to receive that grace. She believes it already when she shows up. Do you understand what I'm saying? She is not warranting. To put it in my terms, sinful woman's love does not precede or warrant Jesus' forgiveness. It's flowing from a forgiveness that's already been given. That's what's happening in this exchange. She's already accepted the gospel. He's given it to her. She first receives and believes Jesus' grace and forgiveness, and because of that faith, she evidences it. I mean, if you've actually believed in Jesus, if you actually are born again, if you actually believe the gospel, then you're going to be extravagant about Jesus, extravagant in your love and worship for him. So Jesus' verdict for her, forgiveness and salvation by faith to her. Your sins have been forgiven. Your faith has saved you. And all the people are like, who is this for forgive sins? Notice here, I want you to get this, Jesus' gospel outreach is to everybody in the room. It is not only to the sinful woman, the sinners of the city, but it is also, by the grace of God, to the good people. <laughs> to people like Simon the Pharisee. Jesus is reaching out to him. That's why Jesus accepted this invitation. Jesus is reaching out to this guy. The good people. You know, they're good people sinners and they're bad people sinners. They're all sinners <laughs> in the eyes of God, right? We, we, we like to put on a show, but <laughs> everybody's a sinner before God. As Ernst Casemann says, Christians are not pious people resting safely on grace, but ungodly people standing under grace. We're all saved sinners. Anyone who's a Christian standing under grace, not resting upon it. The Apostle Paul puts it this way, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I give you the blessing of the kingdom. You belong to the household of the Father. That's what he just said. Do you see her? Do you see this woman? She's in heaven with the Lord. I hope you see her. I hope you will see her. How does Jesus see me? Ask yourself that. And the good news is he sees who you really are, but he's so gracious, he calls you to himself. Ask, am I believing, believing that grace, and thus lavishly, giving my life to him in worship, in my work week, when I'm at school, wherever I am, does he know that I love him and belong to him? Let me show it this week, Jesus. Let me believe you and love you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.